Welcome to Smart Cleaning School. Are you ready to reshape your mindset and grow your cleaning business? Step into today's class with your guide, Ken Carfagno, so you can win for your family. All right, welcome back to the Smart Cleaning School podcast, helping visionaries make the impact they were meant to make. And boy, do I have an awesome visionary with us today. Ricky Regalado, I just want to thank you so much for coming on to the show today. And there's so many topics that I want to just dig into, but uh, just thank you so much for coming on. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, well, let's let's dive into some fun stuff. And what I always go first isn't like, okay, let's talk about your eight to nine figure domination of the cleaning world let's, and, and how you're cleaning in every state in the country now. And you just bought janitorial store and you got get route and you were a keynote speaker on the maid summit, all those things. We'll get to those. I want to learn about Ricky. So this is one of those situations where, Hey, I'll share. It's like kindergarten. I'll share first and then you share. <laughs> so here's my story, Ricky. You were just asking me about my son, my oldest son, prior to me hitting a uh, record or starting the podcast, you know, he's my podcast editor and I have five kids. We homeschool. My oldest turned 17 next week, which is hard to believe. My youngest is four. And we teach our kids, Ricky, from a young age, around 11 is, you know, the world out there is tough. And I don't trust me personally. I come from a corporate background. I was a mechanical engineer for five, six years before we started the cleaning company. But we don't necessarily believe that jobs are going to be a great future for our children. And maybe some of them, they may go that direction. We just believe that we need to help them take control of their future. Uh, we're a family of faith, we're a Christian family. So obviously we have a lot of disciple training that we do for our kids, but we believe that we need to teach them how to become entrepreneurs as early as possible. We teach them how to start their first businesses at 11, 12, 13, as, as soon as they can come aboard. My oldest guy, he's on his like fourth different business and just figuring out the kind of stuff he likes. Now he's doing podcast editing. He's been doing this for me and he has some other clients for the past couple of years, you know, outside of his homeschooling. That's a quick story on my family. We're from the Philadelphia area. We built our first company in upstate New York that we sold in 2018, but we wanted to be back closer to family. Family is huge. I think we're going to connect on this a lot, Ricky. Yeah. Family drives me. Family gets me out of the door. Family is what makes me want to grow my business more so that I can be around them more than I even am. Like, I just want to be with my family. I'm, I can be very introverted. And just hanging at home. I just, I love that. Hang with the kids, hang with my wife, go out places. So that's a quick, quick one on me. We'll dig into more, but tell me about you. Tell me about Ricky. Yeah, man, family, you're right. I mean, I, I come from a Latino culture, right? I'm 100% Mexican myself. So, I mean, when I grew up, it was, it was all family. Like I, I had a lot of friends. I went to many different schools. I think that was a benefit actually. But like I grew up in a household of really two and a half families. So it was my aunt. And her kids, which are my cousins, which I, they're like my brothers, right? And then I would have aunts and cousins always flying in and staying. So this home was a three bedroom home. We had 10 people there. But I thought for me growing up, this was normal. Like we would go to family parties and, you know, we'd play kick the can, what the salvado, you know, red light, green light in the street. But with each other, um, we would venture with other friends, but like we had such a big family that everything was us together. So without even purpose or intentionally, like as I grew and I went out, ventured off, went to you know college and went to, to work corporate America, same as you, right? I really quickly figured out, all right, I'm not a number. I don't like to be looked at as a number. I don't, I don't like really being told to just, hey, stay in your lane. You know, that's not your department. But because I was, I was a creative guy early on, and I just had a lot of ideas that I thought would be cool to share. Little did I know, and you know, in corporate, I didn't want you to share too many ideas, in my opinion. It's like, stick to what you do. There's a guy for that. When I started the business, it was with my wife and my cousin, but it was like, I thought that's the way you're supposed to do it is you should have a friend or a cousin or a relative to make things easier. But I got to give you kudos. We didn't know entrepreneurship though. Like it, it, this was not something you do. My father always worked in manufacturing. My mom always worked in uh, the marine manufacturing. Everybody worked for somebody nobody started off anything in my family. So it was very scary to do it, but I did feel confident. I was like, yeah, I got my cousin on my left. I got my wife on my right. I got my dad, my aunt. I'm like, this can't, this, I'll be okay. This, this, this could work. You know, I got their protection, their, their security with me. That is such an interesting background. How old were you when you came here? 
to the U.S.? Uh, born and raised. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, you... I'm born and raised. I'm a first generation okay. entrepreneur with my family. And, and just... Okay. So you're you're from Chicago then, that area? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, born okay. and raised. My father moved. I always we joke about it. Like he tried three times, got deported back. Uh, fourth time, he made it. He, he, he got into to the U.S. from Mexico. Uh, but that's when he met my mom. <laughs> he got married early on. My mom and my mom was 19 when she got married. So she was a uh, U.S. citizen. She was a U.S. citizen. Yep. How old was your dad when he when he on his fourth attempt? Fourth attempt, he was 19 himself. Wow. Lived in a garbage dumpster for like eight months in Dallas, because he was gonna, he was making his way to to Chicago. Like he he had family here. He had a sister. That was my next question. He knew Why where Chicago? he was going. He knew where he was going. It just took him a minute to get there. Dude, and you're talking about he never went to school, you know, no education at all, not even kindergarten. Didn't get his first pair of shoes till he was 15 years old because he worked on the cornfield. Like the cool, the good thing about my family back in Mexico is my grandfather had a lot of land. Not typical, but that was how you made a living in Mexico is you, you had a farm, you had a land, you had crops. You know, that's how you got by. And he had a big family, 10 brothers and sisters. Are, are you connected? Are you and your wife, your children connected with your family in Mexico? Not too much, man. Your grand, your uh, the family yeah. here, my grandmother and grandfather from that side, you know, they passed away when I was really young. Mm. But yeah, there, there is, that's, that's the only unfortunate thing right now is there is not a strong connection with my family back in Mexico. But the family that he has here, we do speak and, and see each other, cousins of cousins, right? Like I'll, I'll run into them and that, it's tough, man. When you do have a big family as you do start to, everybody goes their own direction, I guess you could say. Um, but my close-knit family, my mother's three sisters were, were close as hell, man. Very core part of the family. Is your, your mom from Dallas then or Chicago? Well, my mom's in Chicago. Okay, yeah, so he, he, yeah. got, he got to Chicago, met her here. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's funny, okay. he met her at a baile. Where? Uh, well, at a baile, so it was like a dance, oh, okay. uh, a dance hall. So here's an interesting fact. The family that I lived with, that I told you that we lived in a home growing up, that was my two cousins, Vito and David. Their mother is Tina. Tina is my mom's sister. My father is Jose. Jose's brother is Jerry. Jerry is Tina's husband. Ah. So the two brothers married two sisters. You're full cousins. Oh, uh, like you're hundred percent cousin. Yeah. So my side's Regalado. My cousins are Regalados. <laughs> we're as close as you can get. We're like we're bro- we're basically like brothers. Where I look, talk have the same character, you know, same traits and characteristics as my cousin. And my cousin is more like my brother. So it's, it's pretty, yeah. if you see us in a room together, you're like, man, you're more like him though, or he's more like you, but it's, I got to believe it's because of that, you know, my, my father and his dad. Yeah. Being oh, brothers. no doubt. Do you have, do you have siblings from your parents? I have a brother. You have a brother. My, yeah. My brother, yeah, my brother's Alex. He's our CFO. Oh, okay. Okay. He's my, he's my younger brother that basically, and turned our company into a very green and just processing protocols company, man. He, to say he's my, he's nine years younger and I would never have imagined that he would have come on board. Uh, it was a godsend. It really was. My father, if he was alive today, he'd be, he'd be stoked, man. Seeing that my brother's working with us. Cause he has a soft spot for my brother. He raised my brother growing up. Mm. So to say it's Rosalado, right? Rosalado and company would yeah and Rosalado Ken comes from I don't you may have heard this part I don't I don't know my cousin my cousin's last name is Pedroza okay my last name is Regalado combine the Rosa his end to my end of the last names and it just created Rosalado so to say that Rosalado is a family business is an understatement oh yeah no I mean it's funny because people will say and you know introducing Ricky Rosalado and I'm like "Eh, not quite (laughs) but Or they call the company Regalado, and I'm like, uh, almost, but not. But yeah, understatement. Well, for sure. well, a lot of people say that, oh, I have a family business, meaning that our family runs a business, right? But you have a family business the way that you know, which is you grew up in the home, 10 people in three bedrooms, and then you have your family has always been tight. You don't know anything different. So what I find so interesting is you start a company and you're like, well, why would I have anything different with a, with me starting a company? Anything we do, oh, yeah. we're a pack. Anything we do, we're together. Yeah. I don't know if this is a, not, a, a negative notch or a mark on us, but dude, when I, that's why recruiting is tough, man. Recruiting and hiring, because 
especially early on, Ken, it was always, well, cousin Mackie could do it, you know, or cousin David could come on. He could take that on. Or what about my uncle? My uncle Jerry could do it. Like we went to the family first. Interesting. So not, like we didn't go to a resume. There is no resume. Like early on, it was family, family, family. If they don't understand it or know it, let's send them to a class. They'll figure it out. 85% of the time it worked, man. Uh, you know, there was some that it just, it wasn't for them and they went to do their own thing. Out of curiosity, you said you see your mom has a Mex- Mexican background as well, although she was born here, right? Uh, she's 100% Mexican. Okay. So yeah. how much of your family speaks English versus Spanish or both? Just out of curiosity. Oh, they all do. They, they all, all speak, speak. W- both languages. Well, because of the, the structure, like we have 80% Latinos that work at Rosalado. Okay. Uh, so Spanish is spoken quite often in the office. And it's helped me keep my Spanish going because it wasn't, you know, out of, after I left high school, went into college, I really didn't speak too much Spanish other than my father didn't speak English. So he was my like connection to speaking Spanish because my mother and my aunt and my mother's side, they spoke English first. That's just how we communicated. The Spanish came really from my dad's side of the family. Where'd you go to school? What'd you study? What, what was the corporate track? Yeah. When'd, you, when'd you meet your wife? Is that along that path? Like, yeah, let, me, so let, me, went, let me hear that path. Oh, for sure, man. I, so I've been with my wife since I was 19. She was 17. So I've been with her for 20 years, over 20 years. Uh, we were girlfriend and boyfriend up until six years ago. We got married six years ago. So we put our business in front of our getting married first. Like we, we just kept putting it off. But I went to literally four different high schools because my mom moved to Florida at some point. I came back college. I went to like five different colleges because I had to dream to be a basketball player. Uh, <laughs> really? Uh, I didn't work out, uh, but I played ball. I played basketball at Milliken University, but then I quickly knew that it wasn't going to happen, so it was okay. Then I went back home to community college. That's when I got together with my wife at that time. It was when I moved back to back home. Then I went back away to Illinois State, Loyola. I graduated from Columbia College, and I got a marketing degree in sports marketing, right? Again, sports was always something I wanted to do, but graduating for six months, I did not land a single internship. Through a lot of my stuff early on, I did not have a lot of accomplishments, you know, in my opinion, when I tried to do so much and never made it. I never got accepted. I was down to the second person. I was almost hired. I was almost brought into this program. So as of late, you know, a lot of the recognition and awards that I've been winning has been long, long time overdue. coming. Long overdue, in my opinion. Yeah. So there's a cool tie here too, Ken. Is Okay. So I graduate college. I go into the mortgage industry and I find Dominic, who's on a lot of my podcasts because he's now my director of operations. I found Jay Gonzalez, who's my partner and runs the Rosa Contract Using Maintenance Company that we have right now. Okay. He was my boss. Like right out of college, these people became my mentors and taught me sales and taught me I, what I think is close enough to entrepreneurship as I thought it could be. In the mortgage industry, you got a team, you got a pod, you got a um, appointment setter, a cold caller, a junior LO, a senior LO. You got a team. You feel like your own business there. We had a few years of success. Market crashed, went downhill. Me and Dom kept sticking together. We were like, She's oh, like 05 to 08? 05 to 08, yeah. And okay. then 09, 09, 09 in 2010, Man, it was struggle. It was like, dude, we're nowhere near where we used to be. And Dom is my mentor at the time, right? He's the one who showed me the ropes on the sales side there. And we just kept going job to job together. And I was with Marley the whole time. So that's why Marley and him are very close. But we corporate, then we, then we went to like the Groupon and inner workings companies here in Chicago, two big fortune 100 companies. That was the moment I would tell Dom too. I'm like, dude, I don't like this. I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to start this business with my wife. I don't know if it's going to work. Don't follow me do your thing. We will meet again. So he went off and he did his own thing at, at a, he worked at a BMO Harris bank, I think, but it's crazy. Cause then that was 2012. Mm. Come back to 2016. Dominic's back in my life. I cut his salary in half. I told him to take a risk on me. And now it's all paying back coming to fruition. But he was one of the first non-family members that, you know, when we talk kind of about, yep. you know, first it was always first find family. Then you get to the point, you know, at that point we were coming up to 2 million in revenue and I was just me, my wife running the business and doing everything. Right. We had manpower cleaning. We had manpower inspecting, but I was doing the books. I was doing the invoicing. I was doing the quality control. I was doing hiring and it was overwhelming. So when I started to bring people like that back in, 
is when we catapult it to the next level. So it's like, I feel like the early on years is something we could talk about for hours because I hope and I wish small cleaning companies get to the 1 million in revenue and surpass it. Because once you do, man, our blue collar industry, the bar can get raised and you talk about people that can make a difference in our industry. It's the small business owner, not the medium, not the big. The more small businesses break through the 1 million mark, the better for our industry. There's about nine or 10 things you said in there that I would love to unpack. I just wrote down a couple of things. <laughs> wow. Okay. You already answered one of them. I was going to ask you about that transition of hiring the family to non-family, but you also said something else very interesting. You're the first I've heard talk about using, essentially outsourcing your entire workforce, right? Manpower, you like the company manpower. So you had them doing all the cleaning and, and inspecting. So essentially you outsourced the cleaning itself from the very beginning. So this is something I, I thought I may not say on here, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to share this stuff here. Okay. It's tough to hear our industry and a lot, of, a lot of the small business owners in Facebook, right? You hear them saying they struggle and they want to they hit six figures, seven figures in that first year, second year. I'm like, man, it takes three, four, five years at some point, right? Like, mm. dude, the first three years, nobody knows, right? But our first three years of the business, I, I, was, uh, I had a DUI. I couldn't drive for the first almost four years of our wow. business. We launched. Two months later, I got my DUI. I was out of commission. My wife drove everywhere. And this is 2012. This is 2012 to 2016. Oh, wow. And we broke a million. We broke 2 million, like 50 employees, 70 employees. But we were stuck doing a lot of the work, right? We were still doing a lot. And it was 10 times harder because we, we, we couldn't separate. Like, you know, how, like you say to that point where two heads are better than one. Mm -hmm. Hey, you go take north side. I'll take the west side. I'll clean 10 houses. You clean 15 offices. I'll do this. Like there was no separating. She had to drive everywhere. So like when people say they struggle, they, you got a car, you got your body and you got time. You can get a lot of stuff done. You get a partner in, replicate it, break off. You get a third person in. This can be done, man. It can be done if you just check your ego at the door and know that you are going to be a cleaner for the first three, four, four years of the business. And that's okay. You should be proud of that. What, what did your schedule look like? Just give oh, me, a, give me, good. just give the people out there just a taste of what you and your wife were physically working 2013, 2014, no. 2015, so, before, before no one, anyone knew who you were. You're out yeah, there hustling. Two and a half to three years, we were cover out first, right? Remember I had a friend, I bought into a franchise. Yep, I'm so familiar with that. That is one piece I could say we kicked off a little differently than really building something from the ground up where we had like 30 accounts. But what we didn't know, Ken, is, we lived an hour and a half away from that territory. And right. in Chicago, an hour and a half is a long way, right? So we it's a long drive. way anywhere you go. Yeah, anywhere <laughs> you go. So the first two and a half years, we're driving an hour and a half to accounts that were one day a week, one hour cleans, five days a week, two hour cleans, seven days a week, one hour. Clean. Like frequency was all over the place. Yes, it sounds like a lot when you have 30 accounts, but half those accounts were like one or two days. We had to get really good at logistics and mapping it out and saying Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, we're going here, 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 from this time to this time to this time. Wednesday, we're going here. So we got really good at logistics and breaking off everything, right? Or she would drop me off, go clean four accounts, pick me back up. You know, like it was 18 hour days, 18 to 20 hour days for the first two and a half years. Wow. No family parties. My friends didn't see me for three years. I was off the grid because there just was not enough time. If we were going to make this work, there was not enough time to really have a social life because we had a vision. We did. After the first six months of me thinking this was a side hustle, I was like, if we focus and do this right, Marley, at some point we will get out of the cleaning, but we're not going to do that if we don't live and breathe it. Was that the vision? Yeah. The, the vision was, I want to work on this business because I feel like I can make an impact. If I can work on it and make strategic decisions and hires and sales and build a business you know, I would say, babe, we don't ever have to do anything else again. Like, this is it. Anything we do will, will evolve around this industry and business. And that's all come to fruition. Because so that, that, that fueled you. That fueled you yeah. 18 hour, 20 hour days for three years. And Chicago is not warm in February. Oh, dude, in, in the winter. Oh, my God. We didn't have kids. So that was another plus. That we helps. <laughs> that helps a lot. For the first six years of, of this business, 
we were uh, we would come home and we'd be like, I say this one all the time. Hey, did you lock the door? Like, did you lock the door? And we just sat down. Like, you know the feeling when you sit in the bed? I do. Oh, man, that was like 20 hours of work. To get up and have to drive. To get there, to know, yep, the door's locked. <laughs> and that's it. And drive all the way back. You actually got up and went and checked. Oh, no, we got up. Oh, yeah. And Dude, we, can't, we were so worried. I, I was so worried. Oh, like, I, I did not want to lose anybody. Every customer mattered. I didn't care if you were one day a week to five days a week. And then what we did learn, Ken, too, is by doing the cleaning, because again, remember, I didn't price some of this stuff. Some of these accounts were inherited. Yeah. And it taught me how to then go price. Why? Because we would sit there. There's this one account in particular. It was five days a week, one day a week. It was almost 7,000 square feet, a, a clinic, like 12 exam rooms. And I'm like, after we first cleaned, and we didn't look at the time, we just cleaned. I'm like, Mark, we've been here for three hours. I mean, we're done. If we cleaned, it's good quality. But I'm like, this is priced for two hours. One person, two hours. Ouch. Like, How are we going to do this? Like, so we would, we'd, we'd have fun. She would run with the garbage can and I would throw the garbage, <laughs> like line it up. <laughs> then she would line up the kit so then I can clean and she would spray first. And then I would come behind and it was all strategic. I'd figure it out. What is do you have any videos of this? Yeah. Like what is production rate these people talk dude, about? Dude, do you have videos of this? Oh, dude, I wish I did. We you don't. got you got you. You need so to get this. you need to dig something up from this era. People need, do. need to see this or hear this. Is this the first time you've talked about it? Some of these occasions I've talked about, but not to, not so detailed because you know usually podcasts are like thirty minutes. So yeah, well, I I want to get into the fun stuff. I like to get to know wow. people. Yeah, this is no. cool. Okay, wow, keep going. Hey, you learn accounts though. No, Rick, I didn't do this to clean. I get it. Trust me, nobody does this to be the cleaner. I you know you, you have to work your way out of a 10, 15 an hour position. I get it, but you can't pull anything out of me, right? Like I know everything about how to clean, where am I? I'm not the best cleaner. I'm not the most efficient cleaner, but I know the basics and the fundamentals where I could do on a walkthrough, start an account. I can go sell an account. I understand what the scope looks like. I understand what dilution looks like. Mm. Just make yourself that much more well-rounded, I guess, right? You're a well-rounded business owner that may be a CEO. You may stay on as the chief marketing person. You may stay on as the COO. I think we lose touch of just because we're an owner of a company, you may still be an owner with a C-level position though. So you're still work, you know, you're, you're involved. You still need to know the minute you lose touch, you're just an owner now. You, you, you limit. Do you still find business. yourself going into the field just to show, just to show people that you're still involved? Oh yeah. Now? More so sales. I mean, if it's a big account though, we do, I do like to kind of help okay. with the account setup, but it does become where it's, it is tough to get back in. I would love to. When you do, how does that really land with the team? Are they like, wow, look at him. He's here with us. Oh, yeah. Especially now. Here in Chicago, my team's in Chicago because they, they've seen some of these articles or they'll see like one of the Univision specials, right? Where they're like, it's Ricardo. Ricky, Ricky está aquí. In Spanish, they talk. <laughs> but dude, I don't even think about it, though. It's like, I just, I, I help. You know, you just, you get it. You're just so naturally involved, or we are, with each other, everybody here. Any yeah. position you hold, it does not matter, which I think could sometimes hurt us because you don't want to practice that all the time, right? Like you do want a process and, you know, it affects if an operations person comes in and does the job of an area supervisor, but it doesn't mean you can't just pop in and say hi, right? Like we're one position we struggle to launch, but it is my goal in life is to have a chief people officer, right? So you see technology companies have this and I see how in our industry, it would work, man. Imagine if you just had somebody who their sole job was to go out, look at Ken at 9 p.m. in the clinic or in a, in a restaurant after hours, lights are out, they're by themselves cleaning. And you see this person come in and just ask you how you're doing. You know, how are you doing? How's the kids? Do you need anything from us? It's been like a month since I saw you in the office. You know, you don't get to come to the office all the time. But imagine if you could connect with them like that. Because dude, it's... You feel alone out there, you know, like when these cleaners and the minute they feel alone, we're just a job and now they're going to leave. There's no culture. The, the company doesn't matter to them. All it is, is a paying check. Mm. And you've lost at that point. You'll, you'll lose. That right there was pretty powerful, Rick. Pretty powerful. Okay. That's important, man. I mean, yeah, 
people talk about it. People are everything. But my buddy Dave Thompson said an engaged employee, though, is even better. Like an employee is an employee, but somebody who's engaged and like connects with you and they know your names, right? How many employees do some of these business owners, you could probably say they don't know everybody in management in the office. That means they don't come into the office that much. Like that's our fault. You know, when I know somebody doesn't know my name, I'm like, I didn't introduce myself. I've been away from the the core group of the company that they don't even know my name. Like that, it hurts. That that That's when you start to feel like, am I getting too big for this? That's not right. Like that's not our vision. That's not what we have set out to be was that C-level exec that sits in the corner office and doesn't speak to anybody. Hell no. Mm-hmm. That's not the industry where I'm in. Yeah. Okay. This is the part of the, the direction. I want to take a few of these next questions. Mm-hmm. So I want to go backward again in time. You'll see I do that a lot. We'll go forward then like, oh, go rewind a little bit. Yeah. So I want to go back to your first with your dad. So your dad came to Chicago. He was looking for a family. What was his first job? And what was it that you saw him doing growing up? So the first job that I remember as a kid was he was a driver for a tortilla company here in Chicago called El, uh, El Totonilco. And they're still around. But they were just corn tortilla manufacturer. He would be, he was a driver. That was the first job that I seen him that I knew what a job was, right? I, I was like eight or nine or even 10 years old. And then, but then after that, all I ever remember was him working late at night. He would leave with lunch, come back with lunch. And I didn't see him as much growing up. Like, like when I say he, he got laid off and then he started to watch my brother, he was a stay at home dad for a while, you know, cause my dad, you know, he didn't have his papers in order. He didn't speak English. He didn't have a driver's license. He never drove. He had no driver's license his whole life. I take it back. He did drive, but he lost it. So, but he struggled. And to see his face when he started working with us and for him to tell me, Rick, I've worked for 40 years, manufacturing, driving skids, driving forklifts. This is the highest paying job I've ever had was working with us in 40 years, Ken, because he was a minimum wage guy. Every job he worked, it was minimum wage. And that was tough for my mom to, she got her GED, but she was a woman in a man's world where she like worked on the line at a manufacturing. So both your parents worked. Yeah. Well, I was raised by my grandma. Oh, my grandma's the one who really raised me. Okay. I didn't hear that part. No, yeah. She, we have that in common. No, yeah. They, my grandmother raised me because yeah, they both had to work. Oh yeah. My mom's the one who made the money though. You know, by the time, you, husband, by the time your brother was growing up, your dad was with him. My dad started. Yeah. My dad stayed home. Right. And him off. He did. He didn't work for a while. And he's, he, so but that's what, like for me, Minimum wage jobs or like low paying jobs or blue collar. That's all I knew. Nobody in our family worked in like that industry of, you know, banking or corporate America and even teachers or cops. No, I didn't have any of that. So where'd the motivation come from? I mean, obviously the work ethic, you saw that clearly in your family. You have the, you have the, the communal aspect of your family. You have the work ethic you saw but now you're going to go to college. Is that something that you saw in your family? Are you the first one to go to college? First, first graduate in college too. So where, okay, where'd that come from? Where'd that drive come from? Well, I liked school. I actually liked school. I, at, in high school, I loved it. Junior, you know, junior high, loved it. I just, I enjoyed going to school. So I saw people were going, but it's, it's crazy. Like I applied to maybe 70 schools. I got into one. 70 colleges? Yeah, I got into one. <laughs> I, but I'm talking because I do it. I, I wanted to leave. Right. So I was like, oh, UCLA, Duke, Penn, uh, you know, USC. I was applying every, I think it was a game. <laughs> I was like, all right, how many applications could I do? And my mom's like, Rick, I got to pay $30 every time you apply. Like, what the hell are you <laughs> That's doing? That's $2,100. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I did it. I just, I didn't get in. I got into Milliken though. So that was good. But I, I, I just knew I wanted to, you know, follow suit, take the next step. I saw my friends going. So it was just, I kind of followed what my friends were doing. So you just, wanted success, right? I wanted but, success. I like wanted you saw that, your, you moment. saw your dad, you saw your dad working hard, but not making a lot of money. I'm just, I'm, I'm dissecting a bit. I'm just reading yeah. into the, between the lines. You saw your dad working really hard. You didn't get, you never saw him. And he wasn't making enough money, even from all that work. And you're thinking, okay, I, I want to have that same mind, that same work ethic, but I want to have a better opportunity than my dad had. And so the only thing you, I'm guessing the only thing that you perceived at the time was, well, other people are going to college for success. So I need to do college and I like school. I don't want to assume that's what it is, but that's what I'm reading into it. No. Yeah. I, I, I assumed 
because then I started to see my mom start to be recognized a little bit and like she would start to travel now she was in a management position she was growing in her company so it was really watching her grow and I was like you know mom what do I got to do next uh you saw the corporate structure with your mom I was like what do I got to do next to get to I want to make money for us for a family she's like you gotta go to school gotta go to college college. yeah gotta get your degree which you know I'm a big advocate for school but at the same time I think you got to learn at your pace like there's so much different Sure. Stuff that I should have learned in college that I didn't because it's so cookie cutter. Right. And it's like, yeah, you have to take this course. You have to do this. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with what I want, oh. but I'll do it, whatever. You know? So I don't even talk about that, but yeah. Well, you got that. Your mom had a map. The only, map, map. The only map that she knew to draw, which is from where she was. Okay. To get the step. I'm at step D I've had to work my brains out to get here. I think my son could probably get to step a, B, and C much faster if he goes to college and gets this degree. So she just saw that yeah. you could see. I totally make sense. I was in the same boat. I mean, I come from my mom's side. They are all college master's level and above graduates. So I'm not the first one at all in that side. On my dad's yeah. side, the Italian side, I'm the first one that went to college. And they were so proud because I went to Penn State engineering. They're like, wow, he's so successful. He's going yeah. for engineering at Penn State. That's what they knew. I was like the college graduate. They'd like tease me a little bit, like, you know, give me a pencil, you pencil pusher and this, that. Yeah. But the other side of the family, I'm I'm just a number in a sense, because everyone did that. Yeah. But that's the only was- map I was given too, is if you want to succeed, work hard, go to college. I don't want to do the blue collar thing like my dad did. He worked yeah. for an electric company, filled up electric company digging ditches, running back on machines, jackhammers in the street, working all kinds. He used to call blood money, working the yeah. the week, the nights, the weekends, every good day. I'm like, why? Well, I, I want that work ethic, but I don't want that work. And yeah. so for me. Think about it too, Ken. It's, it's, fast, it's been fascinating now that I've been building this, the, the tech side of, the, of stuff too, where right. you see, man, I had a good point here. What, what is it? So I feel like it's starting to shift where, blue collar like Im- let's take immigrants right yep you could say you know our parents are immigrants right so absolutely are, i feel like immigrants by heart are entrepreneurs because coming here they're like man i don't know what it is to do this school thing i'm just going to open up a shoe repair shop or i'm going to open up a meat shop i'm going to open up you know a dry cleaning like for them especially indians right indians come here they, they're entrepreneurs the minute they hit the no ground. doubt <laughs> no so, doubt but it's like you're starting to see though that this blue collar immigrant can go to school or is intelligent enough to build what is the future now is technology, right? Love it or love it or hate it. You don't get a 10 X on a blue collar business. You get a 10 X on a technology product, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, an invention or a SaaS product or all these things that is tech related. But I've seen the shift now of blue collar that has that drive and entrepreneurial spirit Now they start to take risk, man. There's a lot of people taking risks to say, I can build a product too, you know, but they, I I don't, I feel like they weren't engineered to think like that, but this generation that's coming with internet and phones and computers, they are, man. Like they are saying, all right, I know I can be an entrepreneur because I've seen my family now is doing it, but I want to build this product. I'm going to go on a whim and do it, not follow the family business uh, and build where traditionally, you know, white collar is, you go to school for six years, you move your pedigree, you do this, you do that, you know, X and Y is a result of Z and boom, you land. But there, there's but a, they there's, lose the grit. They don't I, have I was just grit. about to go there. Yeah. It's about, there's an intersection here that they're missing is that they, this generation, they grew up thinking everything happened so quick. And let's use the example. Like, so my son and, and we, we, we follow the cryptocurrencies. They're super, they're oh, super. Dude, I got to learn crypto. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm we, so, I'm, I'm, I got FOMO. Different top, different topic. <laughs> and I'm not a big, I am not a big player. We bought some this year and we've Crypto been watching and it. NFTs. Right. Yeah. All that stuff. FOMO. Yeah. It's, it's okay. But, but it's, it's funny because like, if you look at Bitcoin and you just look at a chart of Bitcoin, a one year chart, it looks exactly like a stock chart for like Microsoft. And I was showing this to my son. I said, let me just show you something. Cause he's like, Hey, I'm studying the trend. It's going to do this next. I said, no. Six months of it, of it going up from you know twenty thousand to sixty five thousand, back down to thirty, up to fifty. I said that's that happened in nine months, twelve months. That's not a trend. A trend isn't 
six months. Let me show you Microsoft, IBM. I showed them some actual trends over like a 20 year span. You can see the same trend line over 20 years, but with Bitcoin, it's happening in six months. Good, and, yeah. But but the point of that is there's this mindset that things happen fast now. Everything happens fast. Everything's easy. It's easy money. And so with all the people that are going into technology, I was just about to ask you, where are they going to develop the grit? Where are they going to develop the perseverance, the apply to 70 colleges and only one gets them in? Where are they going to develop that backbone? Yeah, dude, that, that's, actually, that's it right there. Backbone, man. Like my first three years of doing what we did was my backbone. That show because again, I felt the fast money in the mortgage business. I did. I saw, I saw the Lambos, I saw the, the you know, the Ferraris, I saw the Rolex watches, I saw guys in suits, and I was like, dude, it was like boiler room. Remember the, room, the movie Boiler Room with Vin Diesel? A long time ago. Like that was the life I was living. I was like, oh, so this could happen fast for me. Okay. And we went back to reality. And it was like, man, what happened? You know, like we were we were up here and but that moment is when we were like, all right, it could happen though. Never forget that you can go up and down. So keep pushing, you know, be, be intelligent and smart with your decisions that you make, you know, think of longevity versus short wins. Yeah. So it was, yeah, man. I, and you're right. Like with this generation of this, especially this, yeah, that was actually a good analogy. I didn't think about that. Like a trend isn't a short period of time. That, that's a risk, high risk. Like no doubt. Cause that could turn around on you real quick. One day you're loving it, feeling it, but that's see, that's where in our industry, you can grow your grit to build a long bit, a long-term working business because we're contracts, we're annual, we're reoccurring, we're recession proof, we're pandemic proof now. Like I'm telling you, man, people, people are noticing about our industry. Ken, like uh, private equity companies do it. I get letters every week, every week. Really? Offers. Yeah, we've been we're up to like forty plus offers to buy the business. <laughs> is it tempting? Is, the cleaning is it, is is, it tempting? This is PE private equity firms it, that know. Holy cow! This industry just went through a pandemic and didn't even get phased. Yes. If they did get phased, it was because the clients of it. But they did it right, pivoted. Nothing happened. They grew. If anything, we grew from this industry. <laughs> so I got to tell you, man. Right? I love our, I love our space. Is it tempting? I, I used to be the guy that would walk in the first five years of my business. I would be the guy that would walk in and what do you do? I have a guy, I own a cleaning company. I own a cleaning company. Where now it's, Hey, I own a facility services, commercial cleaning company. Like I'm loud. Right. And I, I yell it and they're like, Oh wow. So you know what? I need cleaning. Dude, my first five years, I did not like being known as a cleaning service owner. I just, it was not glamorous. Nobody really paid attention to me. They would Ooh, walk, you're hitting some buttons right now. They would walk away no. and they'd be in, in a networking event. They'd be like, oh, what do you do? Oh, you own a cleaning company? Oh, cool. Right. And then they would walk away from me. And I'm like, man, I know. I kind of respect here. It's like in my in my local chamber and, and meetings, like, wait, the cleaning guy has a podcast? They they rub their head. They're like, I don't understand. Good. <laughs> But yes. it's, it's right. You're, you're right about that. I've seen the same shift. What you're pointing out about our industry and how it became a little bit more infamous versus inconspicuous, maybe, is when I heard Mark Cuban, and I, I, like, I like him. I think he's a very smart guy, knows technology. And he was, I listened to one of his talks, and he brought up the cleaning industry during the pandemic. It was kind of in a discussion about, you know, where are the next billion dollar companies coming from? And he said, you know what, a lot of them are going to come from this time period, because when, when things are down, when chips are down, and paradoxes change, and people like, oh, like, wow, I need to, there's this missing hole, let's build it, let's create it, let's go do it. The entrepreneur comes alive during that time. And he says, oh, yeah. you, you watch, you watch a ton of, a ton of new Facebooks and Twitters, and those kind of companies are going to emerge out of this pandemic. And he, and he basically says, watch out for the cleaning world. And he says, I own the Mavericks and I've got this building. It needs to be cleaned, this, this arena for basketball. He's like, I never, and Mark's like, I never once thought about cleaning, but I do now because I, I want to make sure that my seats are disinfected and cleaned. And, and I was like, did Mark Cuban just talk about cleaning? Yes. 
I was like, I was like, what? Uh, But he can't, and he wasn't the first time. And it was, it was cool to see that shift. I totally, I totally agree. In the spotlight, dude, we're being recognized. I mean, I tell you, I've got talks now with some of these bigger companies, corporate companies that, you know, one just yesterday wants to give us a a four to 5 million RFP, right? I put, he wants to put it into route, right? So where he's like, Rick, I purposely want you to find me small business, minority owned local providers in the different cities. We have properties, give them the business. You manage it for me though. I don't want to deal. I don't don't want to deal with any small vendors. You manage it, but I want to know you're giving it to those small providers because the more business they get in those areas, the more the economy is going to grow from the blue collar perspective in those areas. Okay. So there's a client telling me like that dude, that, these conversations I'm having with clients is is different than it was three years ago. They're understanding, you know, boots on the ground, local service providers. That's your best way to getting the best service you can versus some of these national big companies that, you know, employees staffing is tough right now. You know, who is going to do a better job? An employee at 14, 15 an hour or a business owner in that same area that has employees where if the employee doesn't do a great job, he's going to step in and do a, a, a better job. Because why? They care. It's their business. It's their name on the line. They have their blood, sweat, and tears. They're going to get it done where this employee could just say, hey, I don't have a babysitter. I'm not going to show up today. Like, do you want to manage that person or you want to work with this person over here? You know, mm. like, yeah. Okay. So I want to go back, back again. Before I do, I had to ask this question. Has it been tempting on those offers? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, just tempting. But for me, it's family first, right? Like, I... I'm still probably four or five years away from even entertaining something like that. Right. Just because I, I, I want to make sure my family's in a good place and that we're all taken care of. But it's right? still and, shocking to think that oh, yeah, a cleaning company. Okay. Six so, to seven EBITDA, man. Six to seven X EBITDA. That was not the case two years ago. Two, two years ago, the same type of company would have offered probably one to two X. Yeah. So six to seven is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I sold my, I sold my first one. It was a small solo cleaning company, but it was three X. Yeah. Which two to two to four was around the average a couple of years ago. But to yeah. think of, yeah, it's, that's amazing. So I, I will go backward, but another, another question for the current. So if new cleaning companies are, are being born when they are every single day, there's, there's more this year than, than 50, there was 52,000 last year in 2020. 2020, 52,000. Do you know what the number is this year, by any chance? Not yet. But it's going to be higher, I'm sure. Because oh, yeah, the average was 31. 31 so for how, how long? How long was that average for? for 2006 to 2018. Wow. So 30,000 and then jumped to it, 50. It's probably going to hit 50. Probably COVID hit had something to do with it. Is but, that commercial and residential? Uh, it was just cleaning in general. So I, just it's, it's got to be both. There's no yeah, way that could just be commercial. 50,000, probably 70 this year. So a question I have is there is a, a viewpoint that we have from 2018 and beyond when cleaning wasn't glamorous. And I go back to 2005, year 2012, and you're like, yeah, I have a cleaning business. But now, now people are starting out. Cleaning is cool. It's hip. And it could be even pa- paired with technology. People are like, yeah, cleaning. I'm a cleaning business. How, in your view, do you teach those newer people a humility about the industry? How do you teach them the history so that they don't think that it was always this cool. Cause I don't think it's healthy for them to think here's what it is, but it was, it's always been like this. Oh man, that's a good one. So I have people that'll fly in here and you know, I, I have people that want to work with us from out of state and they're just like, I see the videos. I see you're making cleaning look, you know, like you said, look cool, look fun. I'm like, yes, we have a good environment. We have a great culture, but you're in the field. You got to learn, you know, even all the high, exa- like, we, our C-level execs or our high management people, I, I keep forgetting that the protocols that have worked, that have made people successful with us, is we send them to go clean for 30 days. Go in the field, clean, know what it is to get an inspection, know what it is to clock in and clock out, know what it is to try to use the key and the key doesn't work. And all of a sudden you got to call in and, and get an emergency backup key, know what it is to not be reprimanded, but to be given a bad inspection. Like, I want you to know the feeling of you just put three hours of work in and then somebody just told you you missed something, you know, versus on top of you just put three hours of work in and somebody said, thank you to you. 
So like all those different feelings and emotions, you have to learn those. I don't care how glamorous this looks because we've heard it before. Where though, oh, I didn't know I was gonna have to go clean, and you know I thought I was gonna work in here in the office. I'm like, our office is empty. Nobody works in the office. You're out in the field. It's a good place to come back and call home, right? And get back to just ending your day or your shift here, and you know having a cup of coffee or a, a pastry or get together. But you're still in the field. It's still a dirty job. It's still a job that you don't get many compliments. So just know that that, that part's never going to change, you know, but I feel like they have to know what it is to walk in the shoes of a cleaning technician before any other thing. Cause then they'll get that humility and they'll know like still, you know, you're processing a building, you're cleaning a building. Um, but now I think what we're able to, to do is use the word essential that we never did before. Oh yeah. It's like, Hey, you're a cleaning, you're a cleaning technician but the work you do is essential. And here's why. Like you before see, people would have said that was a load of crap. Like, ah, what are you talking about? Nah. Right. Yeah. Just at clay cleaner building, whatever. But now it's like, wait a minute. Is my phone carrying something? Am I going to pick it up? Am I going to get a disease? People think about this stuff now. Yep, it's a new, do, new world now. Do you see a difference between the employees that come in and they want to be in the office? They want to do the glamour stuff. And maybe they don't, they don't do as well in the field or they don't want to do it. They have an attitude. Do you, do you see the ones that go through that, that, that prove their humility that go on to greater success within your different corporations? Yes. Everybody who's with us right now is proven that Testament. Like just the young, the, the most recent hire that we've had, this kid went out, worked, sweat, blood, tears. They didn't think he was going to walk into something like that. Mm but it taught him and it really grounded him. And he is, his performance, his output is insane, you know, mm. versus we've had people that bickering. I don't want to do it. I, what do you mean a month? I can't do it. I'll do it for a week. Oh, I can't get there too far. They're never going to make it. Is that the first they thing they do. do? Is that the very first thing, the onboarding of their, of them? All right. The, yeah, the first 30 days of any position you're in the field cleaning. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. But that it, is dude, so cool. a lot of pushback. You get a lot of, but, but the minute we start feeling that pushback and I don't know, Ken, this is something like, I'm going to talk to my operations, my, my partner right now on, but there's got to be some flexibility to, again, like when you're hiring a higher management person, right? Like, I guess there's a little room for just them not wanting to do it because think about it, Ken, if you were, if you're a six figure salary guy coming into a position and you're told you're going to go clean for 30 days. Are you really going to want to do it? Do you have to do it? Some would argue that but it depends. No, if it, it depends that? your va- it depends on your core values. If if serving others is a true core value, then it they should look at it as an opportunity. Yeah, like I've I've got to know and live and breathe those values. If I don't do the thirty days, I I really didn't complete my onboarding. Right, like I did I didn't follow suit in what everybody else before me did. Yeah, it's part to be part of the team. Everyone on the team has gone through basic training. Right. There's no one in the military serving our country that has not been through basic training. Your basic training is 30 days in the field. If they don't want to do basic training, how can they be part of the team? Yeah. Like, yeah. And remember, think about it. You do the military. That's a great example. Those guys become two, three, five star generals, but they started with basic training. Everybody did. Mm. This is so interesting. All right. Now I'm going to rewind the clock again because I do this. Okay. <laughs> so we're digging into all the cleaning is cool. It used to not be cool. It's, I'm curious why cleaning in the first place, college to mortgage. And then I'm going to go on my own in 2011. You said to your, to your mentor, Dominic, and you're like, I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to do cleaning. Like why cleaning? Where'd that come from? So from 2010 to 2012, we had a cousin named Martin. I would see him at family parties and I'm like, man, this guy's, you know, his family is, he's, He's making good money from what I could see and what I hear him talking about. And he's like, Rick, I'm going to go to Mexico. It's, you know, because it, what I think what his whole thing was, they came here and his wife allowed him to follow his dream of he wanted to be a business owner. So they, they had this franchise for six years. And he's like, now it's her turn. So now she wanted to be a professor in Mexico. So they were going to go back. They were going to go to Mexico now. And he's like, we're going to move. I want to keep this in the family. We've worked so hard, you know, like I'd rather give it to you, Rick. And, and, you know, my cousin, Tony and, and my wife, and I'm like, dude, I have no, I, first of all, I don't know cleaning. I don't know how to run a business. I'm okay with what I'm doing, 
there was a period in time my wife came home crying, upset. You could see her just, her whole persona was different. And her job, she was a makeup artist. And she went from loving her job because it was a, it was an artistry to then it was retail, sales, retail, retail, sales, sales. She's like, she had it. And I was like, all right, let's, let's just do something on our own because I'm not making killer money. I'm not that happy with where I'm at. So in 2012, we bought the franchise from him. Mm. And that's really it. it. It was an opportunity at hand. It was the first time something was presented to us that we took a risk on. And dude, since then, we've been taking risk every year. It's a thrill ride for me now. Like, I love the challenge of taking something on. It may or may not work. I mean, that's the, the reason it's called the risk. Uh, but if you do it with somebody, it's that much better because then you both fail, right? If it doesn't fail, at least, at least you didn't fail by yourself. But that's it, man. That's really it. The opportunity presented itself. It took us a little longer than expected to do it, but we haven't looked back since. What was the biggest fear that you had to break through to get to your first million? How much we could endure, like, doing the work. Because it, it was, I mean, dude, you're talking 18-hour days, seven days a week. No life. Like, I got to say, we really didn't argue a lot. Like, we actually were- In time. Com- dude, we, didn't, we, had, we were very complimentary because, I mean, we did a lot together. And at that time, my aunt, my, Tony's mom was helping us. My dad was helping. And just having them to always rely on was helpful because- I, I broke it down literally kind of like this. I'm like, all right, what does it take to get to a million? All right, it's 83,000 a month. All right, I got to make 83,000 a month. Where do I find 83,000 a month? All right, at a good average size account, five days a week, five hours a day, that's a good 25 to 2,700 a month. Okay, but then how much do I got to profit of that 2,700 so then I can put in the piggy bank to start to raise and find my first manager that could allow us to not clean? All right. I need 21 of those. I need a couple bigger ones though. I I started to do the math to Mm. say, we need a van. All right. A van costs $500 a month. All right. I need to find an account that's 2,600 a month and I profit a thousand. So then 500 could go to the van and blah, 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 blah. But that's how I really did it. To get to my first million, I got to 83,000 a month first. Then to get to 2 million, I doubled that. Right. I, I just started to do the math. What accounts do I have to go over And that's why I'm big on commercial is for me, a five day a week, 10,000 square foot facility that I can clean four to five hours a day and I can charge 2,500 to 2,800 a month will get me there that much faster. It might be longer though. So then that's where you start to think, all right, I need a couple 10,000 a month accounts. I need a 20,000 a month account. I need a class A office building, Mm -hmm. you know, like that'll jump me over or I need a 50 branch bank client that'll get me 50,000 a month. Like I started to look at accounts that way because I knew to the penny how much it would cost me. And when I, when I started winning accounts like that, that's when I knew how to project. Cause we went from 80,000 our first year, 250 second year, 600. Wow. 1.8, 2.4, 4.8, 6, 9, 8, 9, and it just kept going. Oh my goodness. That's insane. Yeah. So you're you're past ten. You're way past ten now. Yeah. Wow. That I'm just I'm processing that. That that arc you just went through. So that yeah. so but that first fear you said was I mean could you physically handle this? Could I physically do it? Could you I physically could, do this? Dude, and, I would I would work during the day with my wife and then I would go work as a bar, as a security guard at a at a bar and a nightclub. From, you were doing uh, both. I was doing both because I had to make money though. Like, dude, the the business wasn't making money. That's one thing I learned. The money that I thought he was making, it's because he was doing all the cleaning himself. That's when I knew franchise, I got to stop. So we sold. Oh, when did you, when did you split from oh, the cover off? So we sold the franchise in 2015. Oh. We started from zero again at 2015. You started from zero. Yeah. Because you sold the whole franchise. You, couldn't whole keep franchise. In the- you got to do it right. Yeah. You got to do it right. So everything back. How, back so what was your here. revenue when you sold it? That was two point four million, something like that. Two, no, when we sold it, we were at between the six hundred to million dollar range. Is when we sold back. Okay. I had I had two. This is what ticked me off or triggered me too. We had found two accounts of our own, Ken. Those two accounts paid more than the forty accounts that we had with the franchise. Oh, ouch! I was like, hold you, on. They didn't so get we, included so in the sale though. You can sell it. those. Those two accounts, I could clean those. And make all that money. Yeah. Right? Like 
that's why when I, so you could say we started back over from scratch, but we really, it was parallel. We were at had a parallel a few accounts. Point. We knew at that moment, let's do it. Why? Because we, yeah. we won't feel it as much. Yes, we're going to go back to cleaning. But all we have to do is find people for those two accounts now versus 30, 40 accounts. That's why mm. residential for me boggles my mind because I'm like, man, how? I thought that was logistics. I can only imagine what residential is as, you know, cleaning three, four, 500 houses in a month at different addresses and time frames and driver. And me, is he interviewing you? I'm learning a ton. Like I'm learning a ton from you and, and just how fast you've been able to grow. I keep wanting to go backward and I, I really don't, I don't want to so much because I want to go forward now, but before I do, I, the most important question I have is you've mentioned the term blue collar probably half a dozen times. And I know that there's something that touches your heart with that. And can you just describe it or elaborate however you want to? The drive that you have from working 18 hours a day with your wife and the, the way you were brought up and the community that you're a part of and, and the changes that you see you could affect in your community with what you're doing. Like, what is that vision? What was it? How has it grown? What is it going forward? And I'm guessing yeah. it has to do with this blue collar element because you've mentioned it a bunch. Yeah, man, it's uh, I've, I've, I've been learning more and more on the statistical part of it, you know, because of route, right? We're trying to learn our market. We're trying to learn who do we want to really serve where we know, you know, the top 1% in our industry, which is, this is another, you know, crazy stat, like Rosalado itself, I've reached the top 1% of our industry, right? It's crazy. But Congratulations. There's such a fragmented market though. Like I'm at the lower part where the other top part of the 1%, it's the one, two, three, five hundred million dollar, billion dollar companies, right? They're almost on an island by themselves, but they're still in that one percent. And I, did, I I saw numbers on nine percent of the U.S. general labor workforce, not like just employee workforce, but nine percent of the labor blue collar workforce in America comes from cleaning. Comes from the cleaning. No, industry. really, nine percent. So think about lab, labor related jobs, not. Again, not employment in general. Labor-related jobs come from the cleaning and maintenance industry. So that's a lot, right? So that's a ton. That's a ton. So the and then we always were, you know, everybody's talking about low to middle income families, the the low to middle income wage jobs. Cleaning is a low to middle income wage job. Not even middle, low to low wage job. The more we can help the small business owner grow their business to five employees, 10 employees, 100 employees, and, and not take away from the bigger guys, but but earn the right to get some of these contracts to build a life-changing you know, business. We have to let, you know, you know social media kills every, if you, you think you need to make a million to be successful or you need, you know, to you know, have all this much money where, no, man, you just need to have a successful business, have time for yourself, have time for your family. Mm-hmm. This industry can do that for you if done right. If you price correctly, you buy correctly, you take on the right contracts, you hire the right way, you build the right culture, you build a good ecosystem. We are a big piece to the foundation of America is our industry. I just want to do everything I can to impact it so that when people say blue collar, they still, they think of money. You know, right now when you think blue collar, you think of grind, dirty, doesn't make that much money. When you think of white collar, it's suits at a desk, technology, you kill it. Like that's bad. You know, like those spectrums are so much so off because blue collar is, is the foundation of America. You know, we lose the trade industry or services, you know, America's going to shudder, you know, it it can't live on, on high rise and luxury and smart buildings and this and that, like you still need the grit and the blue collar. So that's why it touches home with me because I've seen it. I've lived it. I've done it. I've seen others that I've not followed what I said because I'm not a coach. I'm not a mentor. I got no agenda. I've got no curriculum. That's why when people ask me to coach, I'm like, I would be doing you a disservice. Like mm-hmm. I have no playbook. So I'll help you. I'll talk to you. I'll build solutions. Um, but the more we can empower and be stronger together with each other, dude, it's, it's going to be impactful. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make a difference because the more they look at their business being more than a mom and pop, barely getting by, don't have enough money to do this, this, and that, it's, it's going to shift, you know, the, the, the small business economy. And it's not just for blue collar as far as cleaning. 
all the small business stores, right? Suppliers, manufacturers, the small business retail stores that are, you know, in the, the neighborhoods and communities. When's the last time you saw a cleaning company that probably cleans for a thousand square foot storefront in Philadelphia at a mom and pop shop? They don't have cleaners. They clean themselves. They do. It's, you know, even though there seems like there's a lot of business, there's, you know, because I'm seeing it kind of too. There's doctors, nurses, attorneys, professors opening cleaning companies. They're, oh, and then if they do it, that's good because they got good business acumen. That's thing. That's another thing we struggle with is our space doesn't have business acumen. Well, look at us. I'm an engineer and you're a mortgage broker. Yeah. Ricky, that was electrifying. I knew you would be a fun guest to have on my podcast. And I, I so appreciate you coming. I, I really want people that are listening to this episode, I want you to stop what you're doing and I want you to rewind the last 10 minutes and listen to that again. That was mind blowing. Ricky, thank you so much for sharing that. Just that section was amazing. I loved hearing your, your story, your family, all that stuff. Your wife sounds like she's incredible, but that last 10 minutes was like awesome. So now as we, as you wrap this up, I want people to know more about you and what you do because I've only hinted at it because I'm not here to say, here's an amazing person. Here's how they've grown to a gazillion dollars. I want to talk about the people. I want you to share, to share your story. I think we did a good job at that. Yep. So what I want you to do, if you were able, could you just, just talk about, you know, Rosalado moves on into other frontiers. Just talk about the different things you're doing, yeah. how they formed up and why you're doing them. And I can put links in the show notes to different, different pieces, but you know, please share what you're doing, how people can get a hold of you. Yeah. So again, kind of thank you for the opportunity in this platform. Like I was telling you earlier too, just 60 to 90 minutes is so much more better to get detailed and dig deep on stuff. So I hope people enjoy a lot of the nuggets, but yeah. So as, as I grew with Rosalado, I saw how much the industry needed help with solutions and not to say that I was doing anything the right way, but I learned a lot. I failed a lot. That's why I always tell people is I failed quicker and just learn quicker. That's it. So one thing though, is about when I was at the 2 million in revenue mark, we hit a wall. It was a six month wall. We had got, we were growing too much and I was wearing too many hats on the sales side. And I was like, man, there's gotta be a better way that I could sell better with my team that you just sell faster, get these proposals out, right? Do more walkthroughs. Like it was, I was doing them all and it, it, it was getting overwhelming. So I looked, I looked, there was like CRM tools. There was a bunch of solutions out there, but it was more for workforce management, especially in our space. And a CRM doesn't help either. CRM just, you know, where you put stuff, you know, you just put uh, information there. So that's where I really came out with the idea of route, right? So route, when I launched it a year and a half ago, it was for Rosalado, but I knew right away because Chicago is a big tech ecosystem. They're like, Rick, you can commercialize this, you know, share it to everybody. It's not, it's not really proprietary. So uh, route was launched, right? The, the digital walkthrough builder for when you're walking, a bidding calculator and a proposal generator. And I say it's my one, two, three that helped us do what I, I talk about today is sell better, sell faster, sell together, mm. right? The quicker, the more walkthroughs you do, the more bids you do, the more proposals you send out, the mo more of an opportunity you are to increase your revenue that month, which is crucial for us. There is no operations without sales, plain and simple. You don't need to think about operations if you're not selling and bringing in business. And then as that grew and I grew and I evolved and I started to hit different points with our, with Rosalado, I saw that there was more we could do, right? The you know, route was doing awesome. There was a community that we're, we were building. Uh, and that's where I thought of the idea of cleaning the cocktails, right? The podcast. Why? why is I had, I had done a couple, Ken, a, a couple of podcasts and I was like, man, this is a, it's cool to share a story. It's cool to to, for me as a, as a cleaning business owner that doesn't really probably get the spotlight or platform to talk about what we do as much. I was like, I bet you there's hundreds of cleaning company owners that I could talk to that have awesome stories that came from different journeys or even software guys or manufacturers or suppliers that again, have different journeys and it's all what part of the cleaning industry. So that's why I launched cleaning cocktails. I got, you know, I got a studio here at the office. I have fun with it. I bring people on. It's exciting to share people's stories Continue to grow, continue to grow. And people may think I do too much, but it's all for the industry. I had Steve and Jean last year reach out to me. You guys may know them from Janitorial Store. They, they're like, Rick, we love what you're doing. So again, I knew some of the stuff I'm doing is touching people, right? It's helping our industry because I'm being genuine. I'm being authentic because this is just, this is my life. This is the way I talk. This is the way I operate. You may like it. It may be rough sometimes, but it's who I am. It's what we stand for. 
But Gene and Steve were like, we don't know anybody else that we would want to give this to or get an opportunity to. Would you be interested in taking over janitorial store? You know, we're getting oh. to the point where we want to do something else now, Rick. And I'm like, well, I'd be honored. Like, you know, well, I don't want to do it by myself. I don't do anything by myself. Let me hold on. Let me talk to some people. And, and we did it. We acquired it, took it on. We're still revamping it. You know, more to come in 2022. We've, we're going to focus on organizing the content better, making it easier for people like that are at different stages of their business and, and really bring together the coaching aspect together. And then, yeah, last but not least, routes evolve into 2.0. So I'll end with be on the lookout for a, now we're calling it the ecosystem, right, Ken? Mm -hmm. So we heard people want CRM. We heard people need sales, right? That's the one thing I didn't do was help people actually get sales with route. It was, you had to have a sale. So we're going, we're creating a marketplace where we're going to match vendors to vendors. So call it Ken Cleaning Company, Ricky's Cleaning Company. I have a contract in Philly, but I'm from Chicago. I can poke you on the platform, give you the opportunity, subcontracting just in a digital format. That'll be part of route. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. so I call, I call goes, rumor. Now I have the sale. Now I have the lead. I'm letting you as a, especially minority and women owned businesses. Cause we have now found commercial clients want to find those type of businesses. I Rosalato have had difficulty finding contractors, even though you may see me post on Facebook all the time, but dude, that's not the best resource to post an opportunity. I don't know who I'm getting. I don't know who's responding. We're creating profiles. So you're going to create right. your own vendor profile. Yeah. You've screened them. Yeah. Highlight, pre-screen, vetted, upload COI, upload your W9 where it's a check mark. If you got a green check mark, you are a vendor that can be utilized by either a prime contractor. That's awesome. Or, I, much more. Much more I, than that. I heard a rumor too that you were going to do something with Swept. Yeah. So I partnered with Swept. Mike and I are good friends because again, I use Swept. Right? Yeah, I'm, 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 a new, I'm a new user as well. Yeah, I've grown my business from the $1 million mark to the 10 plus million using Swept, right? Some people may say, Rick, you've outgrown it. I haven't. You know, I've, I've worked. It's scaled with me. Um, so what we did is because, you know, the sale comes in with Route, the, you manage the contract, you bid, you do the walkthrough with Route. Then you get pushed into, or I'm sorry, take it back. back. You also created a GPO, a buying group with Home Depot, Sunbelt Rentals. Diversity, Georgia Pacific, that we've created a program where if you, Ken's Cleaning Company, purchase supplies through the platform, you're going to get a higher percentage discount. And you're going to be looked at as an enterprise user because they're going to look at route as an enterprise client versus you going into the store or buying online. So we've created that with their, I couldn't believe that we were, that we were able to do that. Um, but that will be live in Q1 2022. You talk about SWEPT is... What's the one thing we're missing is operations. Because I didn't care to do it though, to be honest. There's other people that do it well. All I wanted to do was a easy, accessible push into another system from ours. Think about it. You gathered all the data already. All that data does not have to be double entry. Just push it right in. Push it right through. Uh, we're not there yet. Give us some time. That's going to be in 2022. <laughs> That's the goal, right? Is Ken goes out, sees this opportunity on route, bids the opportunity, wins it goes to the walkthrough, does a final walkthrough, understands what he needs to, to assign a team. You then get pushed into SWEP to do time and attendance, cleaner communication, minimal stuff for the account. Then you get ready for billing and you would bill through route. And you mm. invoice, invoice management because why? Remember, we gave you the contract or you put the contract in route already. So we know the service charge. So again, it's less entries. We just push that data into the invoicing. So it's ecosystem. You know, everything within the ecosystem allows a business owner that didn't have business acumen before, may not have known how to bid, didn't know how to buy correctly, or didn't have a operational software. You've got it all within our platform. I think everyone can see now why I wanted to make sure I got Ricky on this <laughs> show. I've seen you all over the place, but I also got to know you. We had a phone call over the summer and I'm like, this is a guy that's got a big heart. He loves his family and he's got a huge, huge heart for the industry and he wants to grow it. And I just thought that was, that was so awesome. That, that quick call we had over the summer, I'm like I gotta get this guy on my, on the show. And I started listening to your show too. Cleaning and cocktails It is a really good show. It's very informal. That's why I like it so much. There's not, it's like what I do. It's like just bringing guys in, you fly them in 
right? You fly them in, yeah. they come in studio, you have a few cocktails and you just talk and whatever comes out of it comes out of it, but you're helping each other. It's more like a, like a conversation and Hey, you just air it. You happen to be airing it at the same time. So it's a really cool show. Cleaning and cocktails. Yeah. It can be found on all the major podcast providers. Make sure to check that out. Put that in the show notes as well. But Ricky, man, thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. And I, I, it, I see you. bigger fun. things happening in 2023, 22 and 23 beyond. Yes. Yes. Always, always growing, always expanding positive impact, man. Thank you for listening to smart cleaning school class is dismissed. 